By the papers, I hear that someone has suggested naming the new park in Kaka'ako Mother Waldron Park. <laughs> I appreciate this, but I decline the honor. Don't name that park after me. At that park, it, it faces Pohukaina Street. It is across the road from Pohukaina School. It will be frequented mainly by the 1,200-something students at that school. Therefore, the logical name is Pohukaina Park. <laughs> Instead of naming something after me, why don't you come and ask me how you can help? I'll be happy to tell you what you can do. I made myself clear on this, but it may be the one and only time that someone didn't listen to Mother Waldron. On the grand opening of the park, there, were, there was a lot of fuss and a lot of celebrating. I went around and I said my hellos, and, and then I rested for a time under the shade of a kiave tree. A man came up to me with a face that I knew, but but from an earlier age. <laughs> you were my teacher when I was 10 years old. <laughs> yes, I remember. You were 10 and I was 18 and I'm a grandmother now. <laughs> and then he proudly introduced me to his little family. Well, it's moments like this that I treasure more than, than the naming of some park. That these boys and girls remember me. And they come back to tell me what they're doing with their lives and who they're helping in this world. Oh, everyone that I help has to pay it back, but not to me. Everyone I help has to promise to help someone else. Now, I was taught this in school, and I, I learned this in my own life. See, my, my father, the sea captain, A.R. Powers, he was... He was lost in a shipwreck when I was quite young. The court appointed the two of us, my, my sister Emma and I, to a William O. Smith, a prominent attorney. He sent us to Kawaiha'o Seminary, and there we were to be trained in all of the skills necessary so that we may gain jobs to be able to provide for ourselves. We were also to live at the seminary, though our mother would come and visit us often. I first came to the school at the age of five. All of the buildings were made of adobe and stone, and they were several feet from each other. So, in rainy weather, it was very inconvenient to travel from our dormitories to our schoolrooms. And the old chapel was, it was far too small to accommodate all of the students. Our desks and our chairs, they were all old. Our dining room was in the basement. Every morning for breakfast, we were served milk and bread, and for dinner, we had poi and meat or salmon. At five o'clock every day, a bell was rung, and all the girls would run as fast as their legs could carry them to the steps of the kitchen, and there in a pan was our supper, which consisted of a cracker or bread with molasses. Now our food, though plain, it was the best to be had. For our school was very poor. And when we got sick and needed better food, a teacher would go without so that we could have that share. Now this happened many a time. During playtime in the yard, our teachers often joined us. They would hold our kites up for us and play catch. But when a girl got ill, there was no special place to put her. So a teacher would give up her room so that girl could use it as a sick room. In the early days, we all slept together, packed tight like sardines in the attic. Later, they built us a new dormitory and we had beds with iron bedsteads. There were 82 of us when I first came to the school. Later, enrollment grew to 192. And of all the girls there when I first came, only myself and one other were the last to leave. Some, some started families of their own. Some became teachers. Some died. There was always the threat 
of illness in those days. I can't know what it's like to live with that kind of worry. One time, our mother came to visit, and she, she noticed a mark on my sister on her skin. The doctor and the, the principal both examined this spot on Emma's hip. Their concern was that it was lucky. Now that worry had to be kept as secret as possible. It, it could have been nothing. It, it takes a long time for leprosy to develop. It, until we were absolutely certain that it was this dreaded disease, we were to focus all of our attention on our work. But then, then our mother got sick with leprosy. And she was sent away to Kalaupapa. A few months later, my sister was also sent away to Kalaupapa. So you see, I know what it is like to grow up without any family nearby, to have no way to provide for myself but the work of my own hands and the cleverness of my own mind. Now, the teachers of Kauai Hall Seminary, they, they were there with us through rain and through sun. They, they gave us their kindness and their support and their precious time, both outside of the classroom as well as in. Now, they formed my image of what it meant to be a teacher and a friend to a child in need. <coughs> a few years after my mother and sister were sent away, our principal, Miss Ida Pope, she traveled to Molokai with our queen, Lili Uokalani. <coughs> she went down to Kalaupapa to look for my mother and sister. My sister, Emma, she was 20 by then. <laughs> Well, Miss Pope was, she was shocked to see my sister's state. My sweet Emma. She'd always been such a pretty girl. The prettiest girl on the island. Well, Miss Pope told me that her, her face was swollen with bunches the size of a hickory nut. But she still had the softest black eyes and curly teeth, and, and she spoke good English. She had a brand new baby. She had married a man in Kalo, Papa, who also had leprosy, also very severe. And Miss Pope found my mother, who she described as, as very sad and, and very much missing me. Our principal was moved by my mother's silent grief and heartache. So, when she returned from Moloka'i, she, she took an almost mother-like interest in me. She would say that I was the cleverest girl in all of the seminary. She was very supportive of my education. In fact, she even sent one of my school essays to a publishing company in, in America, where it won an award, and it was published in their periodical. When I graduated from the seminary, I moved to Makapala on Hawaii Island. I lived with Dr. Bond and his wife in their beautiful home in Kohala. I'd been there for a few years when I became Mrs. Frederick Walton. We were married on the grounds there. My husband. He was an accountant, and later he became the manager of Volcano House. During our time there, I... I worked in the kitchen and we had three gorgeous daughters. But our family had moved back here to Honolulu when they opened Pohukaina School. My husband had, he passed in, in 1914, but I had my work as a teacher to provide for, for myself and my daughters. I taught fourth grade. And then I became the director of Atkinson Playground. I, I became what you would call a social worker in Kaka'ako. And it was around this time that children stopped calling me Mrs. Waldron and adults stopped calling me Maggie and everyone, everyone called me mother. 
Yes. They did call me other things. <laughs> like bulldog. Or worse. Probably worse. It's true. I did not hesitate to spank a child that needed a spanking. I'd have them hold out their hand and close their fist, and I'd bring out the ruler. But students did not complain, for they knew they were in the wrong. Children need discipline. They like it when rules are, are held fast to without any exception. They say that they don't, but they do. Another thing children want is our honesty. They want us to be straight with them and say it as it is. They come to us with a mess. They don't want us to say, oh, don't worry, that's nothing. No, they want us to say, that's a mess. Now clean it up. That way they can come to us with any problem and know that we will see it for what it is and help them iron it out. I guess I became everyone's mother. For so many needed a mother figure, even, even the mothers, even the leaders in our community, they needed someone who cared enough to scold them when they were wrong and help them see how they can make it right and make sure that no one gets left behind or unaccounted for. Everyone needs that. And yes, sometimes I would go down to the courtroom and, and ask a judge for leniency for a father so that he wouldn't be sent to prison and leaving his family off worse than they already were. And yes, sometimes I went to the courtroom and I paid bail on boys that had been running wild. And yes, sometimes I would drag those same exact people right on down to the police station when they needed it. Every problem has its own unique solution. And sometimes, sometimes the right solution does not present itself until the very moment that you need it. Once I represented the NEA as a delegate at the International Teachers Convention held in San Francisco, we made seed lays to bring as gifts and <laughs> one of those mainland teachers, she, uh, she took up a strand of Job's tears and said, uh, why aren't you from paradise and yet you have tears? I had to defend Hawaii. I, I had to come up with, with something, improvise something. So I told her, listen to me, and I will tell you the story of Job. Job, the very same Job from the Bible, was sitting outside of his home one day, thinking to himself, this life has been anything but heaven to me, but there must be heaven on earth. So he crosses the Mediterranean and finds his way to London in the middle of winter. <laughs> this is not heaven, he says. If I stay here, I'll, I'll freeze into a pillar of ice. Heaven may be across the Atlantic. So he crosses the Atlantic and finds his way to New York in the middle of summer. Oh, this is not heaven, he says. If I stay here, I will, I will burn into a crust. Maybe heaven is across the continent. So he found his way to California and there in Oakland with its beautiful green hills in the background and, and its invigorating climate and its generous, hospitable people. Well, something was missing. So he continued on into the Pacific and found his way to Honolulu. After a week, he exclaimed, Hawaii, you are heaven. Oh, my Hawaii. And then he wept, tears of joy. And where every teardrop fell, a plant grew, and that is how we got Job's tears in Hawaii. Well, I have no idea if the teacher enjoyed my story, but I did. <laughs> you keep yourself busy with good work. It doesn't matter what other people think of you. And there was so much work to do in Kaka'ako. Sports groups to coordinate for boys and girls, but also for women. Women love playing baseball. 
pageants for the schools and Christmas programming and lessons and sewing and cooking and hula and tours around the island. You know, some of the children in this area have never been to the North Shore of Oahu. Can you imagine that? Well, the Kaka'ako is known to be one of the toughest neighborhoods. But it was a neighborhood full of families working hard to provide for their children, surrounded by, by big industries, the shipyards and, and the pineapple packing company. And the children, the children of Kaka'ako, Japanese, Chinese, Portuguese, Hawaiian, Filipino, they were the toughest children, but they had to be tough. And tough does not mean bad. It just needs to be applied to the right projects. <laughs> One time I had to go down and clear up some trouble at the waterfront. Many of our neighborhood boys were making good money diving for coins in the harbor. It was excellent entertainment for our tourists who were tossing the coins out into the water and, and an excellent opportunity for our young men to make money. <coughs> and as many of you know, most of the boys that represented Hawaii in the Olympic meets started as coin divers. Well, Matt's in line wanted to stop the coin diving. Can you imagine what a loss that would have been for those boys? All of that money they were bringing home to their mothers. Not to mention all of the time and excess energy they would have on their hands. Oh my goodness, that is not good for a boy. <laughs> so, I spoke to people and I wrote letters to newspapers. <laughs> I like writing letters to newspapers. It is an excellent way to get people to do what they ought to do. So, I was able to get Inter-Island Navigation Company to allow the boys to use part of their land for a dressing room and showers. I got a business to donate the materials and the boys to go down and build their dressing rooms. I even got a company to donate swimming clothes for them to use for hmm, some of our boys had been diving for coins without swimming clothes and, and that was a source of complaints. <laughs> well, once it was all taken care of, I, I wrote another letter to the newspapers thanking all of the generous and wealthy donors for their money and their time. And I said that I hope the bread you have scattered out on the waters comes back to you a hundredfold. And I said bread because the coins would not come back. Our boys were way too fast. <laughs> well, later that year, for my birthday, they came to my home to present a gift. A golden pin with the word mother. They should not have spent their money on me, and they definitely shouldn't have gotten me something so fancy. I've worn that pin every day ever since. The children of Kaka'ako, they're magic. One summer, I got it into my head to teach everyone how to make guava jelly. I sent all of the children out to collect the guavas, and all of the mothers came over to learn how to make their jelly. That year, we had a fundraiser, and we sold that jelly. We were able to make enough money to pay for the lunches for most of the children at Pohukaina School for four months. But you know the rule. Everyone I help has to promise to help someone else. So when a fire raged through Kaka'ako, those children who got free lunches, they came to me with their pennies. And I was able to buy enough fabric for slips and dresses and shirts. But it was the mothers of those children who were in charge of making the garments. Indiscriminate poverty, uh, indiscriminate charity breeds poverty. Charity is helping someone to help themselves. And look. Most of those boys have gone on to college. They have good jobs or they're providing for their families. And the girls, when they graduate from junior high school, 
I can train them up in four weeks with all the skills necessary so that they can get jobs to help themselves. This is the thing, helping each other so that they can gain better. They can get better. Not naming some park after me. I never needed anyone to honor me for the work I've done. Everyone I have helped was to pick up our community. I will tell you this, this last story. Once, I got very, very sick. So ill, I was sent to Queen's Hospital. I needed a, a blood transfusion, the doctor said. A word of that got out, and everyone from Kaka'ako showed up. Every, every race, every color, every age, they were all there to help me. They went up to the nurses and said, we're here to give our blood for mother. Well, the nurses were very confused as to how I had so many children. They all looked so different. <laughs> but they were there to help me. And they filled me with so much kindness. So I went back to work.